What's poppin', y'all? Welcome to episode 14 of my series on the 48 Laws of Power and relating it back to something that happened in music. And today we're going to talk about how Nardwar is able to get such high-profile interviews. Nardwar isn't some huge platform with connections compared to, say, a radio station, yet he has been able to pull interviews with huge people like Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, Drake, and others that rarely ever choose to do interviews with the reactions from them that can't be found anywhere else. Pharrell had said his interview with him was one of the greatest he's ever done. If you like analysis videos on hip-hop and the music business, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell right now. Law 14 is as follows. Pose as a friend, work as a spy. Knowing about your rival is critical. Use spies to gather valuable information that will keep you a step ahead. Better still, play the spy yourself. In polite social encounters, learn to probe. Ask indirect questions to get people to reveal their weaknesses and intentions. There is no occasion that is not an opportunity for artful spying. The story we're looking at from this chapter is of an art dealer by the name of Joseph Duveen, who was known as the greatest art dealer of his time in the first half of the 20th century and the end of the 19th. He had almost monopolized the millionaire art collecting market by himself, but there was one person who he wasn't able to add to his clientele, and that was Andrew Mellon. The college Carnegie Mellon is named after him, and Carnegie, of course, after Andrew Carnegie. But Duveen's friends told him this was going to be an impossible task. Mellon was a reserved man that didn't speak too much, and the stories he heard about Duveen were about someone who was very salesy and spoke a lot. This gave Mellon the impression he wasn't someone he wanted to meet, and he made it clear to everyone. But Duveen didn't get this far in his career by taking no for an answer. He told his friends, and I quote, Not only will Mellon buy from me, but he will buy only from me. And the next couple of years, he watched Mellon, learning his tastes, habits, and fears. To accomplish this task, he paid several of Mellon's staff, getting valuable information from them. And by the time he was ready to strike, he knew Mellon as well as his own wife. In 1921, Mellon was visiting London and staying at a suite on the third floor of a hotel. And Duveen booked himself at that same hotel just one floor below him. He arranged for his own valet driver to befriend Mellon's valet driver. And on the day he was going to make his move, he was informed from Mellon's valet driver that he just helped Mellon with his overcoat and he was heading down the corridor to ring for the elevator. Duveen had his own overcoat put on and entered the elevator that Mellon was in and he greeted him. How do you do, Mr. Mellon? I'm on my way to the National Gallery to look at some pictures. What a coincidence. But not really, because that was exactly where Mellon was going. This allowed for Duveen to follow Mellon to the one place he knew would guarantee success. After all, he spent a long time studying Mellon's tastes inside and out. And while they walked around the museum, he wowed Mellon with his knowledge and similar taste. Mellon was really surprised. He had a totally different idea of who Duveen was. This guy wasn't overly talkative or pushy. He was agreeable and very charming with great taste. When they both came back to New York, Mellon visited Duveen's gallery and loved the collection. Of course, this collection was specifically catered to Mellon's exact taste and what he would want to collect. And for the rest of his life, Mellon became Duveen's best client. Joseph Duveen made sure to leave nothing up to chance. He wasn't going to just talk to clients and hope he would be able to charm them, when instead he could position himself with just a little knowledge and increase his closing rate. Mellon was one of the biggest, but Duveen did this with many millionaires. He would secretly put the staff of his potential client's household on his own payroll, which gave him constant access to valuable information about where their boss was coming and going, what their taste was, and other information that put him far ahead of any other art dealer. Other dealers saw him as someone who seemed to be everywhere, but at the exact right time. And he knew everything before they did. Eventually, most of them just gave up going after the wealthy clientele because they just couldn't match him. They thought he had some sort of sixth sense. And this is almost exactly how Nardwar operates. Just the reactions on the faces of the people he interviews are a massive contrast from the dull mood they're in when they're doing any other podcast or interview. Many interviewers, especially the radio interviews like Hot 97 or The Breakfast Club, not only come unprepared to an interview 
as is the case with the Breakfast Club when 6-9 absolutely embarrassed them. But they come unprepared and create a hostile environment for the artist. They're looking for some headline to title their interview, which there's nothing wrong with, but it's usually at the expense of the artist. They'll purposely cut a clip out of context that makes the artist look ridiculous or as if he or she said something they didn't really say and they get attacked. In the case of Hot 97, it's usually Ebro grilling a young artist, leaving a sour taste in their mouth. And of course, they're not going to be happy or share anything when they don't even feel welcome. These interviews will always consist of asking questions from something controversial or negative that has happened in the artist's past or is currently happening that they know the artist likely doesn't want to talk about. And artists have learned the tactics these radio interviews use, so once they know they gotta go there for their promo run, their guard is up before the first question is even asked. In the totally opposite approach, much like Devine, Nardwar is calculated and gathers the most obscure information about the artist like an actual spy. Things that nobody else knows, some of which can't even be found on the internet but he manages to dig them up, and we have no idea how he does it. Many people say he speaks to their family, but one instance is when he talked to Ugly God about recycling, and he was in shock because only him and his mother knew about that. And he even asked his mom later on if anyone spoke to her about it before the interview, and she said no. Us as the viewers see Nardwar as having some sixth sense or being the feds, but he's an incredibly good spy and we have no idea how he does it. Also, unlike radio interviews and similar to Devine, he's not trying to get a headline. His videos are always just titled Nardwar vs. Artist, and he never brings up anything negative that the artist would feel uncomfortable or change their mood. He's always making sure they're in a good mood because that's how you get a client if you were an art dealer, which Nardwar is not, but instead of collecting art, he collects favors. Nardwar also has an entire script for how the interview is going to go. Instead of hopping around everywhere like most of these radio interviews, and he's strict with that script. He controls the frame of all the conversations, and if someone tries to veer off, he makes sure he pulls them right back into topic. He keeps the mood of the interviews very lighthearted. He wants the artist to remember their experience with him as unique and in a positive light, and what better way than to give them gifts. But not just any gift, but... A gift that's usually a record that references something they loved in their childhood or something that they currently love now, but usually a memory, and it brings them a lot of joy. They've likely never received a gift from an interviewer before, and definitely not one that's so meaningful. So you might be asking, well, Joseph Devine gets clients from his spying, and that makes him a ton of money. What is the benefit for Nardwar doing this spying since he isn't really getting paid a ridiculous amount of money? Well... Nardwar benefits by building all of these connections that have a positive memory with him and would love to do him a favor. And the favor he usually requests is an interview with someone who is difficult to get an interview with. For example, when he did an interview with NERD and Pharrell was really impressed, he asked Pharrell if he would be able to get Jay-Z to do an interview with him, and it worked. And with Lil Wayne, it was Drake who got the interview for Nardwar. And Drake is not easy to impress. He hates interviews and has rarely ever done any this entire decade. And leading up to the release of Views in 2016, Nardwar was the only long-form interview that Drake did at over an hour long, but it's also the only interview he did in promotion for that album at all, other than Beats 1, which is, of course, because he was signed to a deal with Apple Music, and this was likely a part of it. But the interview on Nardwar with both him and 40, a very rare sight, was totally by his own choice. And it shows us Drake in a totally different light, like a regular person because he even said he can just let his guard down and relax around Nardwar because he knows he doesn't have some sort of agenda that will make any artist he interviews look bad. The reversal to this law says, information is critical to power, but just as you spy on other people, you must be prepared for them to spy on you. One of the most potent weapons in the battle for information then is giving out false information. As Winston Churchill said, truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. You must surround yourself with such a bodyguard so that your truth cannot be penetrated. By planning the information of your choice, you control the game. This is a lesson that Drake had to learn the hard way two times, once with Meek Mill and once with Pusha T. 
In the context of this chapter, being a spy doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing, and it may not even be intentional. In the case of Duveen and Nardwar, it is intentional, but most friends are spies. And earlier in the chapter, it says that one of the most effective ways is to be friends, because friends tell each other everything, or almost everything. And in the case of Meek Mill, revealing Drake's secret that he had a ghostwriter, up until that moment, Meek and Drake were good friends. They had collaborated on several songs together, and Drake decided he trusted him enough that he was able to know that Drake had a writer. And Drake likely expected he wouldn't reveal that. But Meek Mill got incredibly emotional over something as trivial as the lack of a retweet of his album and revealed one of the most devastating blows to Drake's legacy as a rapper and songwriter. The truth is that, even with friendships, revealing the truth as stated in the reversal is very dangerous. Because with people, once the opportunity comes for them to benefit from revealing your secret, they'll likely do so. And if you're no longer friends and they're very emotional, it's almost a guarantee. To expect people to live up to their promises or have a code of honor is the expectation of a fool. It's better to be conveniently surprised than devastatingly surprised. The same thing happened with Pusha T, but we have no legitimate information on how this information was obtained. But what happened was that Drake had to have told somebody, and then that person clearly didn't keep it to themselves if it managed to reach Pusha T. Likely through the classic case of someone telling someone else something secret and making them promise not to tell anyone else, but that person ends up telling someone and asking them not to tell anyone, and before you know it, it circled all the way around. And while this wasn't as damaging to Drake's legacy because it had nothing to do with his music or skill as an artist, it was an embarrassing moment and swung the beef in Pusha T's favor. For his sake, hopefully Drake learned to be much more secretive with his truths and guarding them with a force field of either lies or half-truths. Because a man in his position can trust absolutely no one. Other than perhaps a LeBron James. Someone who's in the same caliber of success that knows how difficult it is to trust people. If you enjoyed this video, click the box on the top right. There'll be a playlist of the rest of the episodes in this series. I'll see you there.